or singles, yeah. Never ever with a floodlight so I can see 90 days down the road. I have so wanted God to come down and say, gee, Don, I didn't mean to make you uncomfortable, son. Let me lay out this uh, next 90 days so you won't be surprised for anything, have to worry about anything, and, and give me a call about day 85 and I'll give you another chunk. Well, I've wasted a whole lot of time praying on uh, whatever, I'm praying on Thursday for God to give me the strength to handle Friday. And it's a waste of time because God will give me the strength to handle Friday, but God will do it on Friday. God's not going to do it in Thursday. I've got a friend who says, if he goes into the future or the past, God says, have a big time, Leon. I'll be here when you get back. And uh, I believe that's exactly true. The only place God is is right here and right now. If I go into the future or the past, I go alone and unarmored. And I'm guaranteed to find dragons in the future and demons in the past. So <clears throat> at any rate, but what I was getting at before I took that little excursion, um, was that I had gotten back to my home, Louisville. I, I got sober in Nashville, Tennessee, and, and actually lived there 21 months uh, uh, after I got sober. And at a year and a half sober, as a pure byproduct of steps eight and nine, my law license had gotten put back in order. And since I couldn't find a minimum wage job in Nashville, Being terrified, I went back to Louisville. And I don't, to this day, I don't believe that was paranoia. I believe in human terms, the crap that I had done, I didn't have any business showing my face around Louisville and reminding people of me. I think God poured oil on the troubled waters of my past to keep the worst of my chickens from coming home to Bruce. But at any rate, I'd gotten back to Louisville. And the second month I was in town, they stuck me up in front of 2,000 people to talk and, and recorded it. And they went out everywhere and people started calling me and asking me to be their sponsor and speak here in AA and do this and that. And my law practice began to pick up. Uh, and that same month, I saw my only child, who I have two now, but she was the only chick in the house for 21 years. Um, Dana, I saw her for the first time in over three years. And two months later, she moved in with me, to live with me all through her high school years. Now I'm carrying a, a debt from my financial past that uh, would, would uh, uh, impress you and make you feel like, um, and, and make me feel like a horse's butt for, for coming up with the numbers on it, but it was a lot of money. Uh, and uh, so I was frantically trying, and I was super involved in Alcoholics Anonymous, sponsoring dozens of people. Um, and I was frantically trying to balance my life. I was missing balance, and it was just awful. And I used sponsors, inventories, prayer, ceaselessly, uh, even got some outside counseling on balance. And finally, after a couple of years of my quest for balance, I was sitting in a noon discussion meeting and I was uh, boring everybody with an update on my progress and my quest for balance when a little fellow Paul piped up and I had never seen him before and I've never seen him since. But I recall that he had been out of the asylum less than a week. He popped up and said, Don, if you could balance your life, why couldn't you manage it? Of course I can't balance my life. It would be managing it. 
but it turns out that God can manage it and will manage it beautifully. It's just like Bill said in his writing. We've just got to do the footwork. Emotional sobriety happens. I can't figure out how to get emotional sobriety and come up with a blueprint and intellectually and psychologically become emotionally sober. I've got to start behaving like an emotionally sober person. And just like everything else in my life, the thoughts, feelings, and beliefs will ultimately catch up with the behavior. But if I keep waiting for the old crazy picture show to change before I take the action, nothing ever, ever happens. Um, and I found that by just relaxing and, and pulling back in part to the third step, uh, one of the biggest keys to emotional sobriety for me is a little paragraph that uh, for me, and I'm not preaching this for anybody else at all, but for me, this is the most important paragraph in the big book. Um, the bottom paragraph on page 62, it's only eight lines on. And it's unbelievable what Bill crams into those eight lines. He's just spent a couple of pages explaining to us that the root of our troubles is selfishness and self-centeredness. And that further, our disordered egos and some of the selfish side are going to kill us unless something is done about it. And goes on to say that we really can't do much about it. And then he does the same thing step two does for step one. He says, wait a minute, don't go jump off the bridge because we found a way around it. Here's what, here's what we did. We had to have God's help, said this. And then Bill goes through and uses uh, a, a literary device that he uses frequently during the book. If he thinks something is really important, he'll say it and then immediately say it again in different words. To my knowledge, this is the only place that he says the same thing four times, one right after another. So I'm going to take the liberty please, of, let, of reading you that little eight page, eight line paragraph. This is the how and why of it. First of all, we had to quit playing God. And then it throws in a little sense, it didn't work. In other words, playing God isn't just not a good spiritual thing, it's an ineffective way to try to run your life. Uh, you'll wind up chasing your tail. You'll be the ant on the log. And the log is floating down the river that the ant is on. And the stupid ant thinks he's steering the log. He's driving himself crazy, running back and forth, trying to steer this log. Meanwhile, he's ignoring all the little ant crap that he could and should be doing. Well, and it's also the pattern thing, that the pattern belongs to God. And the only real glimpse of God's will for me that I ever get is in the absolute right now for my own next action. You know, we're convinced that five seconds from now, it'll be God's will for me to be drawn and on. And you all think, my God, I lost this poor gun talk. Uh, but uh, the truth is, that in the next five seconds, well, we could spend the rest of the, till dawn, coming up with things that could happen in the next five seconds. And they, they would range from technical difficulties to nuclear attack, but things that in the next five seconds could absolutely change what God's will for us what we are convinced God's will for us will be five seconds from now. And yet I want to study about God's will for next Tuesday and 10 years from now. I'm back being the chimpanzee in the quantum physics. I got to stay where I am, where I can see. Um, 
So that's the first time he tells us that. And then next, we decided that hereafter in this drama of life, God is going to be our director. Okay, if I'm going to be in a play, the director will give me a script, which will tell me what my character is supposed to say and do on stage. Now, if I look at that script and, and the equivalent of the script is what I call the divine spark. It's got many, many names. People call it conscience, call it moral compass, they call it better angels. Conventional Christians frequently call it the Holy Spirit. But by any name, it's that little piece of God that's in each one of us that will tell us exactly what the next right thing to do is. Won't tell us what the next three right things to do are, but it will tell us what the next right thing to do is. And that is the script, the equivalency of the script. Well, as an actor, I look at the script and say, oh no, man, if I follow this script, my character will be really weak and I think the whole play will flop. So I'm gonna add lip. Instead of saying what I'm supposed to say, I'm gonna add lip because I think it's better. I will have chaos until I follow the script for the simplest reason in the world. The director has the power and I don't. In case we still haven't got it, Bill tells us again. He is the principal, we are his agents, employer, employee. I'm working for a fellow. He picks me up early in the morning and drives me out to a job site and says, Don, I've got a line laid out over there and you need to dig three holes. And they need to be to these dimensions and they need to be spaced this way. And I'll come back and pick you up lunch. Guy drives off in his truck. I get looking around and look over where the line is. And those holes don't belong over there. Too rocky to be digging there anyway. I'm going to dig them over here. That man comes back at lunch. I'm going to have chaos. And I will continue to have chaos until I dig the holes exactly the way the boss says for the simplest reason in the world. The boss has the power and I don't. And in case you're really thick headed like me, Bill tells us a fourth time, he is the father and we are his children. Kid refuses to eat the spinach. Kid is not gonna eat the spinach. Well, if the parent is firm, and I have found my heavenly parent capable of remarkable firmness. That kid will eat that spinach or that kid will have chaos until it does for the simplest reason in the world. The parent has the power and the kid doesn't. And then in the same eight lines, Bill tells us just how important this is. Most good ideas are simple. And this concept was the keystone of the new and triumphant arch through which we passed to freedom. This idea, this one little thing that he's told us, or one huge thing that he's told us four times in a row. Then the next paragraph of the book begins, when we sincerely took the position, which can be nothing else other than what we just read and what Bill told us four times. When we took such a position, all sorts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer being all powerful. He provided what we needed. If we kept close to him and performed his work well, established on such a footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves, our little plans and designs. More and more, we became interested in seeing what we could contribute to life. Listen to this, as we felt new power flow in, as we enjoyed peace of mind, 
as we discovered we could face life successfully, as we became conscious of God's presence, we began to lose our fear of today, tomorrow, or the hereafter. We were reborn. Now, there are many promises in the big book, and we you know, call the eighth and ninth step promises the promises. And if somebody asks me to read the promises at a meeting, I don't get up and give them a lecture on all the promises in the book. I just say, you're the eighth and ninth step promises and read them. Uh, but uh, to me, those are the most beautiful, powerful promises. Not only in the book, I can't imagine more powerful promises than facing life successfully, having peace of mind, and uh, <clears throat> thinking less of myself and more of what I can do for others and God providing what I need and losing, beginning to lose my fear of today, tomorrow, or the hereafter, and being reborn. Pretty, pretty good description in there for me of emotional sobriety. Living in that circumstance is pretty good, pretty good description of it. Now, how do I implement? Knowing that, that if I'm going to be emotionally sober, uh, I'm going to have to start thinking about other people other than myself. I'm going to have to start thinking about God more. Uh, and uh, I'm going to have to stop demanding things. I'm going to have to stop owning things. See, on the days that I wake up and my life is mine, this house I live in is mine, my law practice and reputation is mine, my life and reputation in AA is mine, Sharon's my wife, kids are my kids, my cars, uh, on down the line. It gets miserable trying to juggle and protect and uh, uh, and keep track of all those things and make sure they're all right. They become a burden. But on the days when I get up and it all belongs to God and I consciously during my morning prayers on my knees Knees say, God, it's all yours. And I thank you so much for letting me be the steward of it just for this one day, for letting me enjoy these wonderful things that you have loaned me and these wonderful, loving people that you are letting me be with today uh, and for giving me opportunities to be helpful to your other kids today. And those days go a lot better than the days when all the stuff is man. When I see it as a daily gift from God, it makes things so much easier. And Bill talks about what is my mantra, truly, truly my mantra is, Lord, please let me not seek to be loved, comforted, and understood, but seek to love, comfort, and understand. I've prayed it multiple times since this meeting started. I pray it in, in, in every situation. I pray it by, by waking my wife with a kiss in the morning or her waking me, which is more apt to happen. Uh, and uh, I, I prayed it in front of, silently in my head, of course in front of juries that were qualified to give my client the death penalty. Uh, I, I, I prayed it in front of, uh, of appellate courts on cases where a lot was riding, an awful lot was riding on it. I, I do it with the uh, person behind the counter at the convenience store. Uh, part of my morning prayer is also, Lord, please let me try to bring just a little light into the life of everybody who my life touches today. And, and please let me not bring any darkness 
to anyone. Um, and I have found that for me, and it's connected, particularly one of them is uh, the, the two most important and powerful spiritual traits are courtesy and persistence. Uh, as long as I am unfailingly courteous, number one, I almost never get in conflict with my, with my fellows. Almost never. And I cannot be in conflict with my fellows and be okay with God. Just as I cannot be okay with my fellows if I'm not okay with God. Those two things are very much intertwined. But the one that I've got control over once in one action at a time is my interaction with God's other kids. You guys are the only tangible part of God that, that I ever actually see, that I can hug, that I can communicate with. Um, and I believe with all my heart that whatever I do for or to God's children, I do for or to God. Um, and courtesy applies everywhere. And if, if I do it, I'm way down the road toward love, loving, comforting, and understanding the other person. Because discourtesy is the opposite of those things. In fact, I've come to the conclusion, that, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure of it for me, and I suspect it's true universally. It is absolutely impossible to be discourteous and spiritual at the same moment. It just can't happen. Uh, and it, it's so unfortunate that often we are more courteous find it easier to be courteous to strangers than the people who are the very closest to us, the people we live with. And I think that is so sad. Sharon and I have, have, have been married 31 years and uh, been together a little longer than that and we never ever argue. Uh, and at the basis of our relationship, one of the great big components is that we are unfailingly courteous to one another. I believe every little sharp, biting, sarcastic remark, usually flying or sometimes flying under the flag of humor, I think they leave a mark. And I think the mark on the mark eventually becomes a scar. So I think courtesy is... Uh, Awfully important, and if uh, I can think of no single earmark of emotional sobriety that's more important than courtesy, uh, I just uh, I, I can't. So anyway, you guys get it that I'm a courtesy nut. Uh, persistence, by the way, the reason it's so important is that that's what I've had to do on everything. The only thing I've done perfectly since April 9th, 1981 is not drink alcohol. Everything else I've had to start over, like the love, comfort, and understand. I may have to start that over a dozen times during a conversation. My mind will drift and I have to go back. And part of that is uh, <clears throat> part of loving, comfort, and understanding. This is a real big piece to me. is giving my entire interest, attention, and love to whomever, or actually whomever or whatever, is directly in front of me. And when I do that, when I pray to seek to love, comfort, and understand, and lay aside whether I get the love, comfort, and understanding. Because, see, I found out that, for me, it's a spiritual law 
if any part of me is trying to get you to love, comfort, and understand me or understand me. And that includes things like making sure you respect me and making dang sure you don't step on my rights. Uh, if any part of me is coming from there, I found it to be an absolute spiritual law that I will not be loved, comforted, and understood to my satisfaction. If I'm coming from there and you do exactly what I had thought I wanted you to do, I'll change it before you're done. Bill referred to that too. Because the mistake I'm making is letting my comfort depend on outside things, you, your reaction. The only time it's possible for me to be feel loved, comforted, and understood to my satisfaction is when I've prayed the prayer and I've walked the walk and I've done that. And I wind up loved, comforted, and understood beyond my wildest dreams. Of course, now when I like it and want to hold on to it, grab it, poof, there it goes. I got to start over again, but that's okay. It's all persistence. I know that if somebody tells me that they have constant thought of God, I tell them, well, you have a different kind of mind than I do, Barton, because I surely don't. I'll get busy and I'll go flying through and, and God will not cross my mind for two hours. Which is shame because simply thinking of God is the closest thing to the panacea I've ever found. And being a panacea, one of the things that it will take care of is, is my emotional sobriety. I have never, ever gotten in trouble while I was thinking of God. <laughs> and, and, and it's, uh, it, 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 I do some silly little things that, that I know sound silly, but they're really important to me because it's so important. I've got to first think of God before I can work on my conscious contact with God. Um, but I do things like sometimes put a rubber band around my wrist, which is to remind me every time I see it uh, or feel it to think of God. Or I'll wad up a little piece of paper and put it in a pocket that I reach into frequently. So that every time I feel that, it will remind me to think of God. Going into a car or a room, of course, I don't do this every time, but things work a whole lot better when I do. Um, if I'll hold the door for just a half a heartbeat, if you were standing right beside me, you'd have no idea nothing, anything ever happened but I hold the door for just an extra half heartbeat for God to go in before me. And that has a huge impact on what happens in that car room after I get in there. Um, so that, uh, try, trying to live that way. And, and, and I know all this sounds ideal. It sounds that way to me too. And man, my first idea was, my God, I, you're talking about a saint. I can't do that. And that's still my idea. I can't do that consistently. I can't do it permanently. But what I can do is I can persist. I can keep going back to it and keep going back to it and keep going back to it. And my God seems to be quite pleased with my persistence. I suspect if God had wanted me to be capable of perfection, I would be capable of it. I'm not capable of perfection, but I am capable of persistence. And I think God expects me to persist. Uh, my action is so important in everything. Uh, you know how you turn a toothache over to God? 
you go to a dentist. If you don't believe it, next time you get a toothache, pray and call your sponsor and read a few pages in the big book and let me know how, how you're done. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, it would be great if I gave thanks to God by just getting in a room saying, oh, Lord, remove this burden from me. Poof, gone. But that's never happened to me. Um, you know, if I'm hungry and lock myself in a closet and pray for food, not very likely a hot dog's going to come squirting through the keyhole. I better pray for food and get out of around somewhere where there's some food. So God, and my loving God, what I'm getting at, it will do almost anything for me. But many times my loving God will do almost nothing for me without my cooperation. Uh, it, it's uh, it, it's God's power and grace of which I have none, coupled with my footwork that brings about all the miracles. And for me, it's persisting, doing a quick 10th step. When it, that, that's been one of the greatest molders of my behavior is what I call a 10B when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Give you a quick example. It was almost automatic. If somebody had come in my office and <clears throat> they had a legal problem, maybe it wasn't really in my in my line of expertise, what I've always done, uh, uh, often not any fee involved in it, uh, but me just want to be a big man, you know. Uh, I'll take care of it for you. Don't don't worry about it. Laid on the corner of the desk and something gets piled on top of it, something else gets piled on top of it, something else. And three weeks later, I hadn't done a thing, and the receptionist says, Don so and so is on the phone. <clears throat> it was almost just reactive to pick up that phone and say, What? Do you mean my paralegal hadn't gotten that out yet? Let me check into that and I'll call you right back. Uh, I didn't have to call but two people back immediately and say, I, I, I need to tell you that I just laughed at you. Uh, my paralegal didn't even know it was in the office. Uh, it's been sitting right where you laid it on my desk. But I promise I'll pull it out now and, and, and go to work on it for you. And that's what I mean by being the molder of behavior. <laughs> That <laughs> doing that is so unpleasant. And you know, the wording of that, when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. It was explained to me that the word promptly is only there for our comfort. If we want to be comfortable eventually, we can eventually admit we were wrong. But if we want to be comfortable promptly, we probably better promptly admit that we were wrong. Um, and I've been stumbling this way for all these years. Uh, there probably hadn't been a single day in all those years. If you had asked me, Don, have you done well enough today that it's going to do any good? That I would have said, oh, yeah, I think I nailed it today. Every day I would have said, oh, no. I got sad and I got blindsided by self so many different times. I, I lost the thread. I had to go back and start over. Uh, it just didn't possibly seem like it could do any good. But I want to tell you, when I look at my life, it's done an awful lot of good. Because <laughs> actually, I, I went, went into high gear on this approach to life. Um, in May of 1990, when I was nine years old, I'm not going to get into it, but it was a, a new understanding for me uh, and a new way of living, step six and seven. Um, but I had a good life at that time. A couple of things were killing me, but other than that, I had a really great life. Speaking all over the country, sponsoring 
really literally rooms full of people, all practice doing fine, driving big cars. Uh, you know, everything seemed to be fine. Uh, but um, when I realized that I had missed the importance of six and seven, six and seven aren't where I go to work on me with God's help. They're where I give up on working on me. Like my chasing a uh, balance. They're where I uh, come back to my, my God like third step on steroids and say, Mom, Dad, I don't know anything. I don't know how we got here. I have no idea how to untangle any of these messes. But I'm going to try to behave like a person would behave if they weren't concerned with taking care of themselves and we're trusting you to take care of them. And I'm just going to try to help God's kids do what they need to have done. I'm going to try real hard to listen to that little piece of you, that divine spark, and obey that and do it even when my ego and brain are yelling, what about us? Uh, and I've stumbled that way so poorly for all those years. But the fact is, if in May of 1990, when I had the sixth and seventh step deal, God has said, Don, why don't you make a list of everything that you think you can have that is the absolute best you can have in every single area of your life, material, spiritual, every single area. And I had made the list. And God had granted me that on the spot. Please believe me, I'm not exaggerating. I would have shortchanged myself in every single area of my life. When I'm willing to persist in trying to behave like a person would behave, if they really weren't interested in being loved, comforting, and understood, but were interested in loving, comforting, and understanding others. And they really weren't trying to take care of themselves. They really were trying to help God's kids do what they needed to have done. They learned when they act like somebody who's let go of all the self-determined objectives even the ones I dressed up in spiritual clothing um, and try to exchange them for the perfect objective of God, which I never know. But God always has things in mind with me that, uh, for me that are more beautiful than anything I could have dreamt up of heaven. Now I'm going to close by talking about, and this is, as far as I'm concerned, dead on with emotional sobriety. I'm going to talk about what I call the other 95% of the 11th step. And let me tell you why I call it the other 95% of the 11th step, and I could call it the other 98%, who knows, but get the point. <clears throat> I'm pretty darn good about doing the morning day on the morning routine. Prayer meditation. I'm pretty good about evening. Uh, I use a little checklist on page 86 to, you know, review the day. Of course, do my prayer. And then something will tell me that I've done step 11. Well, I've done somewhere between two and 5% of step 11. <laughs> the rest of it is the time between those two times. In other words, all day, every day. That's the other 95% of step 11. And on beginning on the bottom of page 87, <clears throat> Bill lays this out so simply that it's easy to miss what we're being told. 
but we are being told exactly how to do the other 95% of the 11th step every day, all day. It says, as we go through the day, number one, we pause when agitated or doubtful and ask for the right thought or action. That's the first thing. We constantly remind ourselves we are no longer running the show. That's the second thing. And the word constantly, I was told, was there because on my own, I am constantly trying to run the show. I'm constantly trying to be the ant on the log, trying to steer the log. <clears throat> and then number three, humbly saying to ourselves many times each day, in quotation marks, thy will be done. And in that same paragraph, we get the wonderfully pragmatic 11th step promises. If we'll do that all day, we are told, we are then in much less danger of excitement, fear, anger, worry, self-pity or foolish decisions. We become much more efficient. We do not tire so easily for we're not burning up energy foolishly as we did when we were trying to arrange life to suit ourselves. And that's followed by the shortest paragraph in the big book. It works, it really does. So that's for, for me, the other 95% of the 11th step. And to the, to the that will be done, I, I add the uh, seeking to love company, understanding, laying aside whether I get it. And I, I add seeking to give my entire interest, attention, and love to whomever or whatever is in front of me. Um, my AA hero, Chuck Chamberlain, said that whatever or whomever, I give my entire interest, attention, and love will for that moment become the most interesting thing in the world. And Chuck actually went on said, even if it's just shaving. Um, and so many times, I've had somebody approach me in an AA meeting and for whatever reason I, I found them or after an AA meeting, I found them unattractive and oh God, what do they want, you know? And uh, But I persisted. I've been courteous and I persisted in praying, Lord, let me lay aside whether I'm love, comfort, understood. Let me seek love, comfort, understand this person. And and let me give them my entire interest, attention, and love. And finally, when it clicks, it, you can feel a shift of the atmosphere in the room because everything is different when you're no longer thinking about the next thing you're going to say and what it's going to sound like and what people are going to think about it. When you're no longer thinking about three or four things on different unrelated tracks, when you're not impatiently tapping your foot so you can get them to shut up and get spout some canned wisdom and get away from them. Uh, but when that miracle happens, that dull, dull person becomes the most interesting thing on earth. And some of those dull, dull, unattractive people are my dearest friends today. So that's the way it works for me. And uh, I love you all. I thank you very much for having me. So, it up. Well, thank goodness, Don. Thank you so much. Wow. I just thank you for being here tonight and sharing that. And I'm, I'm scared to say anything to ruin it. So I'm going to go ahead and already open the floor. Um, but just what a blessing to have you here. And, you know, I, wow, thank you. I don't know what to say. So um, 
I am going to ask, is there anybody that would like to share or has any questions for Dawn? I see Judy raising her hand. Judy, would you like to share? Okay, she may not realize she has her hand raised. So is there somebody else in the meantime? All right, so that means I'm gonna call on somebody. Um, Rick, would you be willing to share? Thanks, Sarah. Rick, alcoholic. Don, Rick. thank you so much. <laughs> You've grown in depth and understanding. I'm just so moved with the demonstration part. I fall victim of trying to be too theoretical. And your sponsor used to grind on me. This is about experiencing it. This is not an intellectual exercise. Bob just pounded on me about that very thing. And to see a demonstration of the love, the persistence, and move from the spiritual life is not a theory. We have to live it. That's my takeaway tonight from what you had to say. It is not a theory, and your personal experience with living it uh, lights me up, and thank you so very much. Thanks, Don. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thanks, Rick. Um, DJ, would you like to share? I would. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I'm DJ. I'm an alcoholic. And uh, boy, I'm so glad I came to this meeting tonight. I just want to say I did not know Chuck Chamberlain, but I was at his memorial service, and uh, which was unbelievable. <clears throat> they, I don't know how many people were in the room, but it was a big, huge meeting. And that's actually where I got to meet Clancy. And uh, for the very first time and he was just like you know chuck was his sponsor and and it was at that time that clancy was really just another person in alcoholics anonymous and uh his fame hadn't started yet but um yeah i did get sober in la years ago so i had that experience which was really quite beautiful i'm so glad i stopped in here tonight uh, this Zoom, it's just like so magical for me to be able to hear you talk about yourself and God and life. And, you know, Don, I rarely ever take notes. Once in a while, I'll write something down, you know, you know, a line or two. I have a whole page full of notes for me about you and what you've given me to do specific prayers and uh, what I forgot or what I need to learn. You know, you use the word persistence. As a piano player, I use the word practice. I think it's exactly the same thing. Am I right? Okay, great. Yes. Yeah, just, you know, making sure. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your participation thank here. Just a beautiful share. Thank you, DJ. Great to know you. Thank you. I know for me, you just helped me see so many things in such a new way that I, I can't wait to venture out tomorrow and put these to practice. You just, you have inspired me so much. Oh my God. Um, and Don, if you weren't here before the meeting, Don shared that he's celebrating 41 years on April 9th. So happy anniversary. It's wonderful. Um, may I please call on Tom? Tom, would you be willing to share? Can't believe it. Don, thank you so much. Um, I think you know that uh, you're real important in my life and have been for years and years. You know, I've been hanging on the things you've said. And uh, a lot of what, what you've said for years jived with what Don Pritz used to say, you know, same kind of things. And it brought up a lot of stuff for me. Um, 
I swore that Pritz said one time that 80% of the spiritual life is good manners. <laughs> You know, and that ties into that curse. And I quoted him on that, and he said, I never said that, but I know he did. So anyway, but I try to practice that. I think that's I think that's very important. I uh, you know, I was thinking a couple of things. We had uh, Kathy H the Alan on on this uh some months ago, maybe what six months ago, something like that, and uh, from Cincinnati, and I know you know her. And um, she talked about a couple of things uh, that, that really have stuck with a lot of us. One was, she didn't say the God of my understanding, she said the God of my experience, which is a whole game changer, you know, because I don't understand God, but I have experienced God and I can tell you about that. And that was a beautiful piece. But the other thing she talked about was that her job was compassionate listening. And I think that's that's what I got from what you said, that I'm, I'm here with you. I'm not thinking about, this, you know, I'm going to steal your story or, you know, uh, put in something else or think about what I'm going to say, or what wonderful thing I'm going to trump your your story with. But I'm just completely there with you listening compassionately. I think that's so important. The other thing I did, a, um, I, I led a men's retreat in New Orleans in December, and we called it, uh, we had to quit playing God because it didn't work. You know, and I talked a lot about that. Uh, Tom I, who was one of my heroes, you know, and still is. I mean, he's just, um, he used to say the key word in Alcoholics Anonymous is effectiveness. You know, how's that working for you? You know, that, that deal. And uh, I think that's so important. You know, I mean, I think that's always the thing to ask. And, and, the, and you hit it right on the head that we, it's not, I don't, try to quit playing God because it's not a nice idea or it's not a spiritual thing to do. It just doesn't work, you know, and the longer I'm in this deal, the less it works, you know, and the worse the consequences for trying to play God. And, um, and I use that analogy of the log because we're here by the Cumberland river. You know, I use it in meetings here all the time. And uh, you know, that I'm that ant on the log and every once in a while, the Cumberland takes a turn and that log, you know, and I think I'm steering, you know, it's just that simple, you know, but uh, this has been wonderful. I, I just love you. And uh, always, you know, I think, I don't know if I've told you this, I think I have, but your accent is so similar to all my West Tennessee. My mother was from West Tennessee, Carroll County. And you sound like all of my relatives from down there. And I just, I love listening to you. I absolutely do. Love you, Don. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Love you, Tom. And thank you, Betty. Linda? Hi. I'm Linda, I'm an alcoholic. I just tie spons. Hi, Linda. <laughs> I wanted to wish my sponsor an early happy birthday. I love you very much. Thank you. But I love you too. These, these simple principles that you so um, beautifully convey, um, they're so simple, I miss them. They lull me to sleep sometimes. When I hear you share, I realize my soul just needs to be reminded of them ongoingly. And I um, am so appreciative of this concept of concept. It is a concept for me of courteous, being courteous. Uh, I have a pretty um, aggressive mind. I filter the world through aggression very often and people annoy me AF and yet I'm kind and courteous. People in front of me have no idea how I feel about them. It's extraordinary to practice, really to put this into practice, that I just smile. I had to go into the office today and I was pleasant. I couldn't pull that off, but I have to do it with a power greater than myself and the principle of being courteous. And I'm so grateful for it. I'm grateful for you. I love you. I wish you another several decades more of sobriety and we're all very grateful our lives are enriched for you being here with us i love you spons thank you linda i love you i don't do a shout out to uh, my old buddy aaron ham i didn't realize you were on Aaron. good to see you hey what's up everybody aaron alcoholic um yeah, I was actually just about to raise my hand. That's wild, Don. Uh, I, it's so good to hear your voice, man. It really is. It, 
I, I hope it's all right me saying this, but I actually met Don uh, first in the the courts, you know what I'm saying, legal system before AA. And uh, every time I'd show up and we'd meet, I was always in a mountain of trouble. And uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't you, you, your voice was just calming. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it uh, I knew you had my best interest at heart. And uh, I remember, um, uh, what the hell was it? I I, I was, I, we were meeting down there one time at six and Jefferson. And I was in a, you said, you know, buddy, tell me what's going on. What happened? You know, I'm explaining my story and why I crushed their cell phone and why we were fighting and all that. And you looked at me and you said, you know, and I, I was in and out of the healing place and, and you said something, you said, uh, you know, if you ever were just to really sober up, like really give this a shot, you'd be amazed at how your problems would just start to take care of themselves. There's something to that effect. And I thought at the time you were telling me if you quit getting drunk, you'd stop fighting and we'd stop meeting here. I thought that was kind of, but I, I'm not sure if this is what you meant, but the way I look at it now is, is the real sobriety thing. Like when we, you know, adopt this way of life, like how many things I, you understand what I'm saying. I hope most people on, on here understand it. Um, and I remember you came out to my house one, or there, there was a time, uh, you don't mind me talking about this, do you, Don? No, not at all. But, but there was a time I went to court for like the 40th, you know, a lot of times and, and, and you weren't there and, and Vanessa had met me and I said, you know, where's Don? She says, he's not coming today. And I said, uh, well, we'll just pass it over. I'll, I'll deal with him next time. And, and she goes, Don's not representing you anymore. And I, I said, well, why not? And she said, uh, he, he's you're starting to affect his integrity with the courts. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and what it really, it meant a lot to me. No, no, no. But at the time, like even in my position there, I was like, damn, I was like, he really, like a lot of people, they'll just go say whatever they have to say to do. But I was like, Don actually like practices this stuff, like in all areas of his lives. Uh, and anyway, it meant a lot to me. And you came out to my, my parents' house and, and, and talked to me personally about, you know, kind of 12 step me anyway, Don, I, I just, I could, I could take until nine o'clock, um, and tell you how much I appreciate everything you've done for me and everything you do. And, uh, you're just a, such a special person to me in my life. I listen to your speaker tapes when I'm driving down the road and, uh, I don't know, man, I, I, I just, I hope you understand how much I appreciate everything you do in all realms. And, uh, Sam told me you were going to be on here tonight and I wouldn't admit, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't care if my best friend was getting married. You know what I'm saying? I would have been on, I would have had my phone out at the ceremony listening. So, um, anyway, I love you, Don. Thank you for everything. And I'll give someone else a chance now. So thank you. Thank you, Aaron. I love you, buddy. Thank you, Aaron. Wow. You are so lucky. You got 12 step by Don. What a gift. That's incredible. Um, Giselle. Hi everyone. Can you no? Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm an alcoholic. My name is Giselle. Um, Don, mm -hmm. I hang on every word that you say. Oh, I believe in you and I trust you. And um, and I love you. And I love your guidance and your mentorship. Um, I, I followed you throughout this new period of sobriety. And what Aaron said was so beautiful to hear because I, I understand what he was saying and I understand, you know, from a different place, what you said to him. But, um, you know, you just, I love it because you make it so simple. It's not easy, but, you know, you're so humble and, and you know, you, you say it's okay. You don't pass judgment. And um, I just love listening and learning from you. And I just wanted to tell you that this was fabulous. And I thank you again, my friend. Thank you, Giselle, and I love you. How about we hear from my friend John Pine in Richmond? You want to share? He caught me by surprise. Thank you so much, Sarah. Hello, Don. It's great Hello. to see you, sir. And uh, great to see you looking so well as well. I just got your uh, daily email about 20 minutes ago. Couldn't help but look at it. And uh, it's nice to be connected with you on that 
uh, on a daily basis. What I, what I felt tonight was, you know, how much room for improvement I've got in my life. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I, I look at that as exciting, you know, uh, 27 years sober and I, I've got so much room for improvement in my life spiritually that, uh, you know, why would I ever leave? <laughs> You know, where would I, where would I find this? You know, and uh, the the gifts I've been given are enormous, uh, and uh, you know the ability to be uh, you know just a little bit better than I was uh, down the road, uh, not because of anything I've figured out, which I spent so much so many waste wasted years trying to figure out how to how to be better and, or how to look better is probably the right way to say it. And uh, since I've been in AA, all I have to do is do better. And uh, I, I thank you for saying the crazy picture show never stops because I, I'm, I'm a true believer in that. And, and I do believe it turns into more of a comedy every year uh, as okay. long as I'm connected to Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm. So thank you for all of that. And, uh, I yeah, appreciate it was, it was you so funny. much. I love you too. And uh, Mel M. needs to mute. Thanks. Thank you, John. I love you. Emerson? <clears throat> Hi, everyone. My name is Emerson, recovered addict, alcoholic. First of all, Don, I loved listening to you. You know, my beloved father was a lawyer. And... Uh, it was just really nice. He, he talked kind of in the same tone that you did. Um, I remember once I got in trouble and I, I knew I was going to go to jail and I asked my dad, well, what should I do? He's like, turn yourself in. I'm like, what? He said, you're guilty. Turn yourself in and do the right thing. I mean, he was a man of integrity and, uh, you know, he never backed off from that. But anyway, I really loved what you said about the only place, the only place God is, is here and now. He's not in the past. He's not in the future. And I've wasted a lifetime living in the past and kind of be there planning for or dreading the future. And even praying that something would happen in the future all the time, forgetting about today. And I, I won't forget the, um, the description of the ant on the log. It's pretty hard for an ant to stare a log. And that's what I've been trying to do my whole life. And only when I don't stare and just, you know, or only when I don't try and stare the log does life run much smoother. You know, I'm a scuba diver and, you know, I know about currents and all that. And going with the current is so much easier than going against it. You can kick as hard as you want. You can try different things, but it's still... It takes your energy and basically you make no progress. And then finally, I love when he talked about page 62. You gave me a new way of really looking at the book about how Bill repeats things. So I was reading, you know, after you read the, the eight lines on page 62, there's a lot of important stuff here. So I read up on page 63 and he says, when we sincerely took such a position, all sorts of remarkable things followed. Okay. And then he says it again in a different way. You know, he provided what we needed if we kept close to him and performed his work well. So I'm going to be on the lookout for those now. You know, you opened my eyes to that, but that was really fantastic. And your, um, how you tied all of this into your daily living, I think was brilliant and it was real and uh, it touched me. So thank you. Thank you, Emerson. All right, last call. Would anybody else like to share? Or Don, is there anything else that you would like to share with us before we leave for the night? Just to thank everybody and to you know that I have enjoyed so much being here. Well, we have all enjoyed it so much. I know I have, and I, I hope to get to see you again. I know sometimes you travel to Virginia to speak, and I will be on the lookout for that because I would love to see you in person again. Well, that, hopefully that won't happen, Sarah. Yeah, for sure. 
Okay, so we have a way of closing this meeting. We go into our quiet room and we say a prayer to ourselves of our choice. And then um, we can come back and thank our wonderful speaker. Thank you, Don. Thank you, everybody. Have a great week. Thank you, Don, and everybody.